Um, hallelujah. Allow me to read, okay? So, yeah. Let me enlarge the font a little bit. Okay. Again, we're on the work is for Alexander McLaurin in the exposition of the scriptures on the book of Numbers. The title in this session starts with the hauling of work and of rest. And it came to pass when the ark set forward, and Moses said, Rise up, Lord, let thine enemy be scandered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when he rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. Number 10, 35 and 36. Can you hear me well there? Okay. The picture suggested by this text is a very striking and vivid one. We see the bustle, the mornings breaking out the encampment of Israel, the pillar cloud which had lay diffused and motionless over, over the tabernacle, gathers itself together into an upright shaft and moves a dark broad, broad against the glistering blue sky, the sunshine, Massing as a central fire to the front of the encampment. Then the priests take up the ark and the symbol of the divine presence to fall into place behind the guiding pillar. Then comes the stir of the ordering of the racks and a moment's pause during which the leader lifts his voice. Rise, Lord, and let thy enemy be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. Then with a brace resolved, confident heart, the tribe set it forward on the day of on the day's march. Long after those desert days, a summonously hold of the old prayer and offered it, not as antiquated yet by the southern years that has intervened. Let God arise, and let his enemies be scandered, prayed one of the later summonists. Let them that hate him flee before him. We too, in circumstances so different, may take out immortal though ancient words on which no dimming rust of antiquity has encrusted itself and may, as the beginnings and the endings of all our efforts and of each of our days and the end of beginning and the ending of life itself offer this old prayer the prayer which asks for a divine presence in the incipiency of our efforts, and the prayer which asks for a divine presence in the completion of our work and in the rest that remaineth. One, so then if we put these two petitions together, I think we shall see in them verse of pattern of the realization of and aspiration after the divine presence which all to fill all our lives. Rise, Lord, let thy enemies be scattered. But was not that a moving pillar as a token that God has a reason? And was not the psalmist who reiterated Moses a prayer asking for what had been done before he asked it? Was not the ark the symbol of the divine presence? And was not its movement of the pillar, a pledge to the whole host of Israel, that the petition which they were offering through their leader's lips were granted to Era, it was offered? Yes. Again, the present God would not manifest his presence except in response to the desire of his servants. And thus, because the ark was a symbol, and the moving column was a guarantee of God's being with the host, at their defense, therefore, there rose up with confidence this prayer, Rise, Lord, and let thy enemies be scattered. The twofold attitude, the realization of, and therefore, the aspiration after, the divine gifts which are given before they are desired, but are not appropriated or brought into operation in our lives unless they are desired. 
is precisely the paradox of the Christian life. Having, having we long for, and longing we have, and because we possess God, we pray ah that we might possess Thee. The more we long, the more the more we long, the more we see. But the less we give self in anticipation of our longing, there would be neither longing nor reception. Only on condition of our desiring to have Him, does He love, does He flow into our lives, victoriously, and strength giving. And the more we experience that omnipotent mind and coming guiding nearness, the more surely we shall long for it. Let us, us dear brethren, a、uh, dear brethren, blend these two things together. For indeed, they are inseparable one from the other, and there can be no real experience in any depths of the one of them without the other. Blessed be God, there need to be no longer interval of weeding between sowing the seed of supplication and reaping the harvest of fruition. Time process of growth and reaping goes on with instantaneous rapidity before the call. I will answer, for pillar and ark. With there, ere Moses opens his mouth, open his lips. It was the Ayanda speaking. I will hear, for in response to the cry, the host moved triumphantly, guarded through the wilderness, so it may be and ought to be with each of us. In like manner, coupling these two conditions together and taking them as united, covering the whole field of life in the great. Antithesis of work and the rest, efforts and accomplishment, beginning and the ending, morning and the evening. We may see that here is example to be a property in our own lives of that continuous longing and realization which we encircle all life as with a a golden ring and make every part of it uniform and blessed. To begin, continue, and end with God is the secret of a joyful beginning, a patient continuance, and of a triumphant ending. There is no reason, heaven, though there are hosts of excuses on earth why there should not be, in the case of each us, each of us, an absolutely continuous and uninterrupted sense of being with God, all brethren. High above the one on which most of us stand, I'm sorry, all brethren. That is the stage of Christian experience. High above the one on which most of us stand, but that is our fault, and not the necessity of our condition. Let us lay this to heart. It is possible to have the pillar always guiding our march, and possible to have its stretching, coming, and motionless. Over all our hours of rest. Two, now, if we're turning from the lesson to be drawn from these two conditions, taking in conjunction, we look at them separately. We may say that we have here an example of the spirit in which we should set ourselves day by day, and at each new epoch and the beginning, be it greater or smaller, to every task. There are truths that underlie that the first prayer: "Rise up, Lord, and let thy enemies be scattered," which are for perennial validity and apply to us as truly as to those warriors of God in the wilderness long centuries ago. The first one is that the divine presence is the source of all energy and of successful endeavor after and accomplishment of any duty. The second them is that that presence is, as I have been saying, granted its operative power only on condition of its being sought. And the third of them is that I have a right to identify my enemies with God only, on condition that I have made His cause mine. When Moses prayed, "Let thy enemies be scattered," he meant by this the hostile Norman tribe that me. Ring is around that come down like a sandstorm upon them at any moment. What right had he 
to suppose that the people whose lances, the swords, lances, the swords threatened the motley host that he was leading through the wilderness were God's enemies. Only this right, that his host had consented to be God's soldiers, and that they having thus made the enemies theirs. Made his enemies theirs, he on his part was sure to make their enemies his. We often tend to identify our foes with God without having taken the preliminary step of having so yielded ourselves to be His servants and instruments for carrying forward His will, so that our own wills have become a vanishing quantity, or rather have been ennobled and greatened. In proportion, and they have been molded in submission to His. We must take God's course for ours, and in all the various aspects of that phrase, and and that means, first of all, that we make our own perfecting into the likeness of Jesus Christ the main aim of our own lives and efforts. It means the further, the putting ourselves bravely. And manfully on the side of right, the truth, and justice, and justice in all their forms. Above all, it means that we give ourselves to be God's instruments in carrying on His great purposes for the salvation of the world through Jesus Christ. If we do these things, whatever obstacle may arise in our paths, we be sure that these are God's antagonists. Because they are antagonists to God's work in and by us. Only in so far as they are such, can you pray, "Let them flee before thee." Many of the things that we call our enemies come to us disguised that are mistaken by our superficial sight, and we do not know that they are friends. All things work together for good to them that love God, and when we desire His presence. The hindrances to doing His will, which are the only real enemies that we have to fight, will melt away before His power, as wax melts before the others of fire. And for the rest, the distresses, the difficulties, the sorrows, and all the other things that we so often think are our foes, we shall find out to have been our friends. May God's cause yours, and He will make your cause His. That apply to the great things of life, and to the little things. I begin my day's work some morning, perhaps wearied, perhaps annoyed with the, the multiplicity for trifles which seem too small to bring great principle to bear upon them. But do you not think there would be a strange change wrought in the petty annoyances of every day, and in the small trifle for which all our lives, of whatever texture they are? Must largely be composed of, if we begin each day at his task with that old prayer, "Rise, Lord, and let thy enemies be scattered." Do you not think that there would come a quiet into our hearts, and a victorious peace into which to which we are too much strangers, if we carry the assurance that there is one that fights for us, into the trifles as well into the sore struggles of our lives, we. Should have peace and victory. Most of us will not have many large occasions for trial and conflict in our career, and if God's fighting for us is not available in regard to the small annoyances of home and daily life, I know not for what is available. Many littles make a mockery, and、uh, there are more deaths in skirmishes than in the field of a, a peace battle. More Christian people lost their hold of God, their sense of His presence, and have beaten accordingly by raising the little enemies that come down them like a cloud gnats in a summer evening, then are defeated by the shock of great assault and a great temptation, which calls out their strength and sends them to their knees to ask for help from God. So we may learn from this prayer, the spirit of expecting. Expectancy, expectance of victory, which is not presumption, and of consecration, which alone 
will enable us to pass through life victorious. Bit of a good chair, said the master. If in answer to this prayer in its Christian form, I have overcome the world, we turn to the hand and sordid figure that stands mysteriously beside us while as we are all unaware who is coming. And the swift question that is sure up rises to our lips. Are they for us or for our anniversaries? The reply comes, nay, but as catching the Lord's host, come on, come up. That is Christ's answer to the prayer. Rise, Lord, let thy enemies be scattered. Three. Lastly, we have here a pattern of the temper for hours of repose. Hours of repose. When the ark rested, he said, "Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel." That says the beginning of these remarks. The pillar cloud seemed to have taken two forms. Brace together upright when in mood, diffuse and stretch as shelter, and a covering over the host Israel, when it and they were at rest. In like manner, the divine presence protein its forms and takes all shapes according to the most necessary for the Christian trusting heart. We are to brace ourselves for the march. It condenses itself into upright and moving guide. We lay ourselves down with relaxed muscles for repose. It softly expands itself, carrying our head in the hour's rest, as in day, as in the day of a battle. Ah, brother, we have more need of God in time of repose than in times of effort. It's harder to realize His presence in the brief hours of relaxation than even in the many hours of strenuous toil. Everyone who goes for a holiday knows that we have only to look at the sort of amusement that most people fly to when they have nothing to do. We have not anything to do to see there is quite as much, if not more, peril. The communion of a soul with God in times when the whole nature is somewhat relaxed and the strings are loosened, like those of a violin, skewed down a turn or two of the peg, than there is in times of work. So, let us take special care of our hours of repose, and be quite sure that they are so spent as they, as that, we can ask when the day's work is done, and we have come to, sleep at ease, in preparation, for ninety rest. Return, O Lord, unto thy waiting servant. Work with our God, unfaithful rest with Him. Rest without God, unfit for work, for Him. We may take these two petitions and tests of the allowableness of、uh, any occupation, full of any relaxation. Dare I ask Him to come with me into that field of work? If I dare not, it is no place for me. Dare I ask Him to come with me into this other chamber of rest? If I dare not, I better never cross its threshold. Take these two prayers, and where you cannot pray them, do not risk yourself. But the highest form is contrast between the two wits still to be realized, for life as a whole is a fight, and beyond it there is the rest that remaineth, where there will be not merely God's return unto the souls in Israel, but the realization of His fuller presence and a full deeper rest, which shall be wondrously associated with the. With more intense work, though in that work there will be no conflict, the two petitions will flow together. Then, for while as we labor, we shall rest; and while we rest, we shall labor. According to the Greek sayings, they rest from the labors, yet they rest, no day, no night. I'm gonna read on. I think we have more time, am I? So,、mm. Moses. Despondent, I am not able to bear all these people alone because it's too heavy for me. That is in Numbers eleven, fourteen, detail, the circumstances. The leader speak the truth in his despondency, is oppressed with the feeling of his incapacity for his work. 
I mean, it takes the words here as teaching us what men need in him who is to be their guide, and how impossible it is to find what they need in mere men. One, what men need in their guide. This is the lies wandering in the wilderness who are without natural supply for their daily necessities. They have a long, hard journey before them, an unknown road, and the terminus of which was land where they should rest. We are precisely the same necessity as those which Moses despairingly said that they had. Like them, we wander hungry and need a leader who can satisfy our desires. And ever more, give us bread for our souls, even more than for our bodies. We need one to whom we can weep, as the Israelite did to Moses, and not weep in vain. We need one who can do for us what Moses felt that the Israelite needed that he could not give them. We almost indignantly put to God the despairing question: Can I carry them in my bosom? As a nursing father bears the su- the sucking child, our weakness, our ignorance, our hard hunger, cry out for one for one who can bear all these people alone, who in his single self has resources of strength, wisdom, and sufficiency to meet not only the wants of one soul but those of the world, for he who has satisfied the poor single soul. Must be able to satisfy all men, too. The impossibility of finding this in men. Moses' experience here is that for all leaders and great men, he is overwhelmed with the work, feel his own utter impotence, as himself to be strengthened the load of his work, long for release from it. See how he confesses his human dependence. His incapacity to do and be what is needed, his impatience with the people, his longing to be rid of it all—that <laughs> is a true picture. Of the experience of the best man, a true picture of the limitation of the noblest leaders. But it is not only the leaders who confess inadequacy, but the fuller feel it. For even the most enthusiastic of them come sooner or later to find that. The oracle had not learned all wisdom, nor was it fit to be taken as a sole guide, much less as a sole defense or satisfaction. He who looks to find all that he needs in men must take many men to find it, and not multiply city for men will bring him what he seeks. The Milky Way is no substitute for the sun. Our hearts cry out for one great light, for one spiritual home, and the list strings of pearls. Do not reach the preciousness of one pearl price. What a truth! Three, the failures of human leaders prophesy the true leader. Moses was a prophetic of Christ by his failures, as by his successes. He could not do what the people claimed to have done, and what he in his who in his mode of despair, in which the text shows him, sadly owned that he he could not. The word confession becomes an unconscious profit for that it should have so with the set of forms of qualifications for a leader of men, and defined by the people's cries, then should have so bitterly felt his incapacity to supply them is a witness. If there is a God at all, then somewhere the needed ideal will be realized in a leader and commander of the people, God sent and worthy of more glory. Than Moses, the best service that all human leaders, helpers or lovers, can do us is to confess their own insufficiency and to point us to Jesus. All that man need is found in Him, and in Him alone. All that man have failed must always fail to be. He is. Those eyes are blessed; they see no man any more. See Jesus only. We need one who can satisfy our desire, fill our hu- hungry souls, and Jesus speaks a promise confirmed by the experience of all. When tested, when he declares, "He that comes unto me shall never hunger." We need one who will dry our tears, and Jesus, when he says, "Weep not," wipes them away and stanches their sources, giving 
the oil of joy for mourning. We need the one who can hold us up in our journey and minister strength to fading hearts, to vigor, to weary fate, to Jesus strengthens us with a might in the inner man. We need the one who will bring us to the promised land to rest. And Jesus brings many songs to glory and wills that it be with him where he is. So let us turn away from the multiplicity for human insufficiencies to him who is our one only help and hope because he is all sufficient and internal. What a mind exposition. Go ahead. Mm. Next chapter is Afraid of Giants. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get you up this way southward, and go up into the mountain, and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that, dwell, that they dwell in whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not. And be ye of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. And the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Ahaman, Shishai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came unto the brook of Eshkol, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bare it between two upon staff, and they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called the brook Eshkol, because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after forty days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and to all the congregation, and shewed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came into the land whither thou sendest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giant, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Numbers thirteen or seventeen through thirty three. We stand here on the edge of the promised land. The discussion of the true sight of Kadesh need not concern us now. Wherever it was, the wanderers had the end of their desert journey within sight. One bold push forward, and their feet would tread on their inheritance. But, as is so often the case, courage oozed out at the decisive moment, and cowardice, disguised as prudence, called for further information. That cuckoo cry of the faint-hearted, there are three steps in this narrative. 
the dispatch of the explorers, their expedition, and the two reports brought back. One, we have the dispatch of and instructions of the explorers. A comparison with Deuteron Deuteronomy 1 shows that the project of sending the spies originated in the people's terror at the near prospect of the fighting which they had known to be impending ever since they left Egypt. Faith finds that nearness diminishes dangers, but since sees them grow as they approach. The people answered Moses' brave words, summoning them to the struggle with this feeble petition for investigation. They did not honestly say that they were alarmed, but defined the scope of the exploring party's mission as simply to bring us word again of the way by which we must go up and the cities into which we shall come. Had they not the pillar blazing there above them to tell them that? The request was not fathomed in its true faithlessness by Moses, who thought it reasonable and yielded. So far, Deuter so far Deuteronomy goes. But this narrative puts another color on the mission, representing it as the consequence of God's command. The most, the most eager discoverer of discrepancies in the component parts of the Pentateuch need not press this one, this one into his service. For both sides may be true. The one representing the human feebleness which originated the wish, the other d the divine compliance with the desire, in order to disclose the belief, sorry, in order to disclose the unbelief which unfitted the people for the impending struggle, and to educate them by letting them have their foolish way and taste its bitter results. Mm. Putting the two accounts together, we get not a con contradiction, but a complete view which teaches a large truth as to God's dealings. Namely, that he often lovingly lets us have our own way hmm. to show us by the issues that his is better, and that daring, which is obedience, is the true proof. Hmm. Is that amazing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Instructions given to the explorers turn on two points, the eligibility of the, con of the country for settlement and the military strength of its inhabitants. Mm. They alternate in a very graphic way from the one of these to the other, beginning in verse 18 with the land, and immediately going on to the numbers and power of the inhabitants, and harking back again in verse 19 to the fertility of the land, passing again to the capacity of the cities to resist attack, and finishing up in verse 20 with the land once more, both arable and forest. The same double thought colors the parting exhortation to be bold and to bring the produce of the land. Now the people knew already both points which the spies were dispatched to find out. Over and over again in Egypt, in the march and at Sinai, they had been told that the land was flowing with milk and honey and had been as assured of its conquest. What more did they want? Nothing if they had believed God. Nothing if they had been all saints, which they were not. Their fears were very natural. A great deal might be said in favor of their wish to have accurate information, but it is a bad sign when faith, or rather unbelief, sends out sense to be its scout. And when we think to verify God's words by men's confirmation. Not to believe him, unless a jury of twelve of ourselves say, says the same thing is surely much the same as not believing him at all. For it is not he, but they, whom we believe, after all. There is no need to be too hard on the people. They were a mob of slaves, whose manhood had been eaten out by four centuries of sluggish comfort, and latterly crushed by oppression. So far as we know, Abraham's midnight surprise of the eastern kings was the solitary bit of fighting in the national history thus far. And it is not wonderful that with such a past they should have shrunk from the prospect of bloodshed and caught at any excuse for delay at least, mm. even if not for escape. We have all of us one human heart. And these cowards were no monsters, but average men mm. who did very much what average men professing to be Christians do every day and for doing get praised for prudence. Mm. 
by other average professing Christians. <laughs> How many of us, when brought right up to some task involving difficulty or danger, but unmistakably laid on us by God, shelter our distrustful fears under the fair pretext of knowing a little more about it first, and shake wise heads over rashness which takes God at his word, and mm. thinks that it knows enough when it knows what he wills. Mm. Two. We wow. have the exploration, verses 21 through 25. Wow. Ah, hallelujah. Wow. Mm. The account oh, no. of it... Something in the heaven. I have these are almost... Um, mm. Oh, give glory to God. Lord, give you praise. Hallelujah. He is a God of son, at least. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. mm. Go ahead. The account of it is arranged on a plan common in the Old Testament narratives. The observation of which would, in many places, remove difficulties which have led to extraordinary hypotheses. Verse 21 gives a general summary of what is then taken up and told in more detail. It indicates the completeness of the exploration by giving its extreme southern and northern points. The desert of Zin being probably the present depression called the Arabah, and Rehob as men come to Hamath, being probably near the northern Dan mm. on the way to Hamath which lay in the valley between the Lebanon and the anti-Lebanon. The account then begins over again and tells how the spies went up into the south. The revised version has done wisely in printing this word with a capital, and thereby showing that it is not merely the name of a cardinal point, but of a district. Hmm. It literally means the dry, and is applied to the arid stretch of land between the more cultivated southern parts of Canaan and the northern portion of the desert, which runs down to Sinai, hmm. is a great chalky plateau. It might almost be called a steep or prairie. I don't know. How do you pronounce it again? Is that step or steep? Uh, steppy, I believe. Steppy, yeah. I don't know if it's... I can't remember. <laughs> that's a story. You don't remember. So you don't believe me. That's all. <laughs> I'm teasing you there. So, yeah, I'm not the best pronouncer, sir. So, yeah. Yeah. Whenever I'm reading, I can always imagine my dad correcting me because. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause I can't read them than no, he, he's good with the with the English for sure. Yeah. yeah. A, a large step, step, step. Step. Actually, there's no P. Step. Yeah. Step. Almost a step. Almost the same thing. Yeah, I think it is pronounced step. Yeah, step. Yeah, so. Okay. Passing through this, the explorers next would come to Hebron, <sighs> the first town of importance beside which Abraham had lived and where the graves of their ancestors were. Hmm. They were in no mood for remembering such old stories. Living Anaks were much more real to them than dead patriarchs. So the only thing mentioned besides the antiquity of the city is the presence in it of these giants. They were probably the relics of the aboriginal inhabitants and some strain of their blood survived to late days. They seem to have expelled the Hittites who came, who held Mamre or Hebron and Abraham's time. Their name is said to mean long-necked. And the three names in our lesson are probably tribal and not personal names. The whole march northward and back again comes in between verses 22 and 23. Reshkol was close to Hebron, and the spies would not encumber themselves with the bunch of grapes on their northward march. The details of the exploration are given more fully in the spies' report, which shows that they had gone up north from Hebron through the hills and possibly came back by the valley of the Jordan. At any rate, they made good speed and must have done some bold and hard marching to cover the ground out and back in six weeks. So they returned with their pomegranates and figs and a bunch and a great bunch of the grapes for which the valley identified with Eshkol is still famous, swinging on a pole the easiest way of carrying it without injury. 
we have next, or sorry, three. We have next the two reports. The explorers are received in a full assembly of the people and begin their story with an object lesson, producing the great grape cluster and other spoils. But while honesty compelled the acknowledgement of the fertility of the land, cowardice slurred that over as lightly as might be and went on to dilate on the terrors of the giants and the strength of the cities and the crowded population that held every corner of the country. Truly the eye sees what it brings with it. They really had gone to look for dangers and of course they found them. Whatever Moses might lay down in his instructions, they had been sent by the people to bring back reasons for not attempting a conquest. And so they curtly and coldly admit to the fertility of the soil and fling down the fruit for inspection as undeniably grown there. But to tell their real mind with the great, nevertheless, the report is no doubt quite accurate. The cities were, no doubt, full of the wall, wall, and to eyes accustomed to the desert, very great. And there were, no doubt, Anax at Hebron, at any rate, and the spies had got the names of the various races and their territories correctly. As to these, we need only notice that the Hittites were an outlying branch of the great nation, which recent research has discovered, as we might say, the importance and extent of which we scarcely yet know. That the Jebusites held Jerusalem till David's time, that the Amorites, or Highlanders, occupied the central block of the mountainous country in conjunction with the two preceding tribes, and that the Canaanites, or Lowlanders, held the lowlands east and west of that hilly nucleus, namely the deep gorge of the Jordan and the strip of maritime, maritime plain. A very accurate report may be very one-sided, the spies were not the last people who, being sent out to bring home facts, managed to convey very decided opinions without expressing them. A grudging and sure admission to begin with, the force of which is immediately broken by somber and minute painting of difficulty and danger, is more powerful as a deterrent than any dissuasive. It sounds such an unbiased appeal to common sense was it was a keyword was a keyword there common sense huh <laughs> yeah. common sense you see the opinion man am i earthly minded man they're not sinful even so yeah but That's without the ingredient god yeah and the faith like go ahead pragmatic attitude yeah yes pro mechanism of call you know so it's, it's, mm. There are the facts. We will leave you to draw the conclusions. An unvarnished account of the real state of the case, in which there is not a single misstatement nor exaggeration, may be utterly false by reason of wrong perspective and omission, and, however true, is sure to act as a shower bath to courage, mm. if it is unaccompanied with a word of cheer. Mm. Begin a perilous enterprise without fairly facing the risks and difficulties is folly. To look at them only is no less folly, <clears throat> and is the sure precursor of defeat. <clears throat> but when on the one side is God's command, and on the other such doleful discouragements, they are more than folly, they are sin. It is bracing to turn from the creeping prudence which leaves God out of the account to the cheery ring of Caleb's sturdy confidence. Mm. It is was a min minority report signed by only two of the commission. Mm. These two had seen all that the others had, but everything depends on the eyes which look. Mm. The others had measured themselves against the trained soldiers and giants and were in despair. Mm. These two measured Amalekites and Anax against God and were jubilant. Mm. They do not dispute the facts, but they reverse the implied conclusion because they add the governing fact of God's help. How differently the same facts strike a man <clears throat> who lives by faith and one who lives by calculation. Israel might be a row of ciphers, but with God at the head, they meant something. <laughs> That's a very good description. Faith is you hear and obey, right? You know, calculation. Yeah, let me figure out what is the best approach. I mean, so, by our own wisdom... 
and what the sense of good or bad, right or wrong. It's making sense here, you know. So, but it's our own standard, our own judgment, and the, when we continue to do that, will we give God room to speak to us? Obviously not. We shut him out. Am I making sense here? You know. So, hmm. anyway. Observe man's way when they make decisions. It's very easy to see whether they are spiritual led or not. So, knowledge of the Bible, beautiful speech, doesn't have any dent on real decisions. You will find it's always, oftentimes a pretense and guise to the to to to. to it's like a outside the garments, not seeing the people sinful, bad. This operate on a different wisdom, making sense to you, you know, so they don't hear the spirit, nor they're going to obey the spirit, because there's no spiritual input through and through. The self, self-made self realm of existence, you know, so the realm of self, basically. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Caleb's confidence that we are well able to overcome was religious trust. As is plain from God's eulogium on him in the next chapter. What that word means? Let's see. Or some kind of poetic word for uh, praise or mm. eulogy, something with that. Okay. Eulogy. Mm, eulogy. Oh, it's actually is eulogy, another form. So go ahead. Mm. The lessons from it are that faith is the parent of wise courage. Mm. That where duty, which is God's voice, points, that where, sorry, this English is interesting. That <laughs> where duty, which is God's voice, points, difficulties must not deter. Mm. That when, that when we have God's assurance of support, they are nothing. Mm. Caleb was wise to counsel going up to the assault at once. But there is no better cure for fear than action. Mm. Old soldiers tell us that the trying time is when waiting to begin the fight. Mm. Native hue of resolution gets sickly over with that with the paleness that comes from hesitation. Mm. Am I sure that anything is God's will? Mm. The sooner I go to work at doing it, the better for myself and for the vigor of my work. Mm. This headstrong rashness, as they thought it, brings up the other spies once more. Notice how the gloomy views are the only ones in their second statement. There is nothing about the fertility of the land, but instead we have that enigmatical expression about its eating up its inhabitants. Mm. No very satisfactory explanation of this is forthcoming. Mm. It evidently means that in some way the land was destructive of its inhabitants, which mm. seems to contradict their former reluctant admission of its fertility. Mm. Perhaps in their eagerness to paint it black enough, they did not contradict themselves, or they did contradict themselves, and tried to make out that it was a barren soil not worth conquering. Mm. Fear is not very careful of consistency. Note, too, the exaggerations of terror. All the people are sons of Anak now. <laughs> the size as well as the number of the giants has grown. We were in our own sight as grasshoppers. <laughs> No doubt they were gigantic. They got the, fear performed. They got the dusky side of unbelief and the fear, right? So, yeah. Make a con uh, conviction, I mean, convincing argument for the audience. It's incredible the mind of the man works. So, yeah. Mm. No doubt they were gigantic, but fear performed the miracle of adding a cubit to their stature. Hmm. The coward hears that there is a lion without, that is, in the open country. He immediately concludes, I shall be slain in the streets. Mm. It is not usual for lions to sport themselves. <laughs> Thus exaggerated on and one-sided is distrust of God's promises. Mm. Such a temper is fatal to all noble life or work. Yes. It brings about the disasters which it foresees. Can you see that? It's a self-fulfilled prophecy, am I? Self-curse, basically. Mm. If these cravens had gone up to fight with men before whom they fell like grasshoppers, of course they would have been beaten. <laughs> much better that their fears should come out in Kadesh than yeah. when committed to the throat. 
Therefore, God lovingly permitted the mission of the spies, mm. and so brought lurking unbelief to the surface. Can I can I share a story with you? Okay, maybe not necessarily good, but I want to encourage you of what exercise I encourage. When I was a foolish young man, when in college years, <clears throat> I got into this friend. He has a very problematic trouble. He got his girlfriend pregnant <laughs> before they get married. And the girlfriend was uh, is my classmate. You know, get to know uh, because she actually followed me, followed me to the to the city where she tried to learn literature stuff. She was a journalist for the education. She was a journalist for local newspaper, our county newspaper. And they got in that relationship, they got into trouble. So, and um, they wanted to get married and the girl's uh, father was a uh, very rich man, the richest man in the county where I grew up with. And uh, so I don't know all this when and, until those crises broke out. One day the 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 boyfriend, because the girl seems had some you know classmates, you know tried to in the beginning from jealousy. Then later on we get to know each other, <laughs> and they become a good friend. So when he came out to me, he cry for help. You know, so said. You know, can you help me? Because the the father was so unhappy about him. He he literally sent people try to 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 murder him or put him in hospital. They are in hospital. <laughs> Got run down by bikes. I'm sorry to tell this life story, but that's what it happened. So, and he just don't know. The two was pretty desperate. So they they said we don't have any help. Um. So, uh, would you care to intervene? So, so happened. I go back home on week uh, on holiday. You know, we get uh, you have a vacation or holiday. What is it called holiday? So students, you know. So, yeah. So when I back, you know, uh, the train station reached my uh, the town where I go to high school to. So I sent there, and the two, one of them, you know, dare not even go back home. So I had to find where they live. <laughs> Take a lot of time, you know. There's no bike, no. Those they don't have cars or taxations, you know. Had to ride a bus to get on the skirt of the city. Take a long walk. So when I showed up the door, it was great property, and you know, it has factory all around. It's big home in those days. China pretty poor. Getting have a big home. Um, you know, have factories. Those are big things. And um, anyway, the bodyguards, you know, stuff like that. And uh, went there, and uh, he said, "Who are you?" You know, <laughs> I was dusty, sweat. You know, a little lad. You know, says my young lad, and nobody. <laughs> and uh, I said, "You know, let me tell you who I am. I'm a, I'm I'm a, a, a classmate of your girl." And uh, I, I represent them to to try to 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 talk with you. <laughs> so, <laughs> usually he get angry. I try to chase me away, make it sense here, you know. So call his bodyguard to get me away. I said, hold on a minute, you know. Do you want your 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 daughter to die, you know? Are you 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 want your ruin your daughter to finish her life, you know? So the guy, you know, call me back said. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I hear you out. This silly, you know. So, <laughs> even the girl told the mom my head. I said, "I'm gonna show love." The mom was, uh, you know, trembling behind. You know, trying to, to, to mediate. Basically, eventually, I sit down. It's really very nice. Actually, very respectful. And uh, he said, "You know, eventually, I resolve the matter. You know, not gonna attack the guys and." You really can get them married, you know, stuff that is sure, guaranteed married and committed, you know, so, see, see, when should I get married, stuff like that, make sense here, you know, so, <clears throat> but, <laughs> it was interesting, you know, you got to, to, to have some courage, you know, so, and, uh, my point is, you know, courage, sometimes composure, and not be afraid, Change everything, you know. People just don't like the deal with the fearful, and uh, you know they 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 don't respect your experience. Obviously, I don't. 
uh, or whatever. There's no credit, credit, credit for me to even be a speaker, a young man, classmates, literally a foolish young man those days. But because I was able to show some a little bit of courage and composure, in a mad experience, you know, and, and uh, you know, not necessarily um, unwise, and know how to deal with it, at least give you room to, to, to work solutions out. Many things in life is like that. And when we approach with a timid, fearful uh, attitudes, we, we're never going to master at first be anything. Nobody can trust us. And the second, when those things come to you, you know, you just not able to really get yourself together, how you expect others are going to work together with have respect towards you. I'm not using this, uh, you know, I have a lot of such experiences, no one not to highlight my life per se. I'm just talking about the amazing ingredients in life. When you have courage, many things, it seems, uh, they're not challenging anymore, am I? Not that uh, um, demanding anymore. It's not, it's, you know, it's not really, it's all in the mind, you know, so most of the stuff happening is only in the mind. I mean, the worst thing is saying they didn't work it out, you know, so, <laughs> so what a deal, you know, so, and the worst thing in life is you die, what a deal, you know, so if you get over that, pretty much you can face anything, I'm just talking, it's all in the mind, only to pray. Mm. I try to encourage you to think about differently life, you know, not to be ruthless, imprudent, and presumptuous. At the same time, life is full of crisis challenges, sometimes this unbecoming situations. Um, you know, we just have to deal with it in a, in a sense of closure and courage, am I right? So, and confidence, not self-made confidence, but a confidence you know, it's just a life, you know, so I want you to pray mm -hmm. before we finish, move on, so. Amen. Lord, I do pray for courage, Lord, godly courage. Of course, in the face of uh, the many adversities of life, Lord, which in many ways, Lord, especially as we grow in stature and in wisdom, Lord, we come to see as blessings rather than uh, misfortunes. Lord, as such uh, trials in life, uh, you use, Lord, to discipline us, Lord, and to even strengthen us, Lord, and bring us to greater places of uh, understanding and of maturity. Mm. But I pray even for courage, if it can be uh, expressed in such a way, Lord, even in times in which th there seems to be... Uh, Lord, even not even much going on, Lord, times of peace, mm. Lord, courage to be able to not uh, relax ourselves in um, a wrong way or fashion, mm. Lord, to, to lose our focus mm. of what is, um, what you have, uh, ha what you have in store for us, Lord, and what mm. you are having us to do, mm. Lord, to not relax in our duty or responsibility. Mm. Lord, even if in times of peace and prosperity, we are to have this same courage. Um, and so, Lord, may, uh, in a sense, this courage keep our heart and our minds in uh, a state of being healthily high-strung, Lord, mm. not in a, in a, a stressful sense mm. or an unhealthy way, Lord, but mm. um, always heeding uh, your call or in the voice of your spirit and the mm. move of your spirit uh, within us or mm. through others around us, even in our circumstances. Mm. Lord, in this way, um, the the ups and downs or the the ebbing and flowing tide of uh, life mm. will, will never cause us to, to stumble and fall um, on the path upon which you have set us. Mm. But we will always... Um, even as the author of this book illustrates to the books we're going through, we'll always have our eyes upon that uh, that cloud by day or the pillar of fire mm. by night, Lord, and never never wavering from the path, but following and trusting you. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. But not letting the 
the, the way of man, or mm. the, the idea of common sense, mm. the blur of it, mm. the narrow of it, or the, uh, to always resolutely and with wisdom mm. uh, follow after, Lord, uh, your will, mm. Lord, through faith. Mm. Uh, and Lord, we become so identified with this way and in this faith mm. that we, we often we don't even need, Lord, to hear your voice audibly, Lord, mm. because you're functioning and moving so naturally in and through your spirit mm. and through and in the company of others mm. who you have put in lives to work together mm. and fellowship with one another mm. and to be found nonetheless in mm. the presence yes. of your spirit at all times, Lord, we never want to leave that presence mm. or be in it at all times mm. or uh, would your people be blessed in this way mm. come to live in this way mm. of simplicity and of purity and mm. of faith and hope Amen. I pray this Amen. Mm. Hallelujah there's only a tale here can you finish it so we ramp it out today mm -hmm. mm. therefore God lovingly permitted the mission of the spies and so brought lurking unbelief to the surface where it could be dealt with. Let us beware of the one-eyed prudence which sees only the perils in the path of duty and enterprise for God and is blind to the all-sufficient presence which makes us more than conquerors when we lean all our weight on it. It is well to see the An Anakim in their full formidableness to feel that we are as grasshoppers in our own sight and in theirs. If the sight drives us to lift our eyes to him who sitteth upon the circle of the earth and the, inhab and the inhabitants thereof, mm. however strong are as grasshoppers. Hmm. Well, bless you, Noah. It's a, always a joy to spend yeah. time with you. Be encouraged, <laughs> okay? Have a great day now. So, listen, I have um, on Friday. Decided John as John invitation because Katie has a birthday, uh -huh. so we're gonna stay in the the called the lodge. What they call lodge is the lake, by the lake, Christian Lake Lodge. So, on Friday night, oh, yeah. yeah. So in the morning, I talking about the Saturday morning, nine o'clock. Yeah. I might have spend time there with you, uh, you know, from uh, the lodge. If not. We might okay. bypass it. I, I'm going to let you know. just want you to know that that's going to happen in the lodge instead at All home. Right. So, yeah, we may just move, move to Sunday morning instead, you know. So let us okay. know. Um, most likely I'll be able to spend time with you. Hopefully so. If huh. not, uh, let you know. Okay. So, yeah. No worries. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Bye right. then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Uh-huh.